12.30 p.m. in India and 9 p.m. in New Zealand. We'll tell sure. you about, yeah. So we'll let you know why we're saying talking about three different time zones. Now, you know, Speaking Minds has been curating events with our speakers from around the world for the longest time, as you know. We are India's largest international speakers bureau. Through these COVID-19 times, we have continued to engage with our clients and with our speakers, and we have brought in thought leaders, motivational speakers, stand-up comedians, artists, all on a live streaming platform. Today, I'm joined with by Mark Ingalls, the world's... Hi, in everyone. Hi. The world, sorry, there is a bit of a technical glitch, so I'm not able to really hear myself a bit better. But hey, please bear with us. So we, there's Mark Ingalls, the world's first double amputee to summit Mount Everest, who was in an ice cave for 13 and a half days a few years ago, many, many years ago. Many years. Mark will share his story with us. We have Shazia Mirza, an English stand-up comedian who loves India, who's been to India many, many times. And Shazia has a very interesting story. Shazia has been on an island with Bear Grylls and a few others in isolation. And Shazia has also been in a celebrity reality show called Celebs in Solit Solitary. And she was in solitary confinement for, I'm going to use the word confinement for, five days in a container. What also brings me back to the old stories that we've heard of Nelson Mandela being imprisoned. And he was in a you know, he was in isolation for 18 years. We also know of Anne Frank's story, who was in isolation for two years. Now, bringing all this together, I'm very interested in knowing for us and for our audience, what does it mean? What does, what's, kind, what's the impact of this on each one of us? But before we go there, Mark, can you share your story with us, please? Oh, sure. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, I do have uh, some experience in isolation. Uh, when I was 23 years old, on a climb in the southern alps of new zealand i was trapped in an ice cave uh, due to bad weather trapped in an ice cave that was i don't know smaller than underneath an office desk and in there for 13 and a half days 324 hours hardly being able to move with virtually no food lost 40 percent of my body weight Every second in that ice cave, I had to make decisions on how to survive. And those are the decisions that have put me in good stead. One of the decisions, of course, was do you get hypothermia or do you get frostbite? Hypothermia will kill you. Frostbite, well, actually, it doesn't. But it did mean I lost both of my legs from just below the knee. A, a, a great lesson. Uh, and it was really like a gold standard to change. And it was something that uh, that I hark back to, uh, even now, in isolation like so many of us are around the world. It's uh, those decisions, those uh, learnings that I've taken from that, that, that are just so important. So, Mark, when you were in that cave, did you think it was going to end in one day? Or did you think you would be rescued soon? Or did you not know? Well, we didn't know, and so there were two of us in the cave, Phil and myself, and every minute uh, we thought, well, you know, if the weather clears, we'll be rescued, and that just continued. Uh, it was like um, this never-ending uh, decisions that you needed to make, and so you had to look forward and say, well, realistically, uh, we need to plan to be here for another few days, for another few days, for another few days, you know, and that happened, that went on for 13 and a half days could it have gone on longer probably not we were close to death at the time and, and so the, um it's how you make those decisions with uh with that um with no surety of future at least now we actually have some surety of future so in your case you only had five shoesbury biscuits right to live on so having food having no water having no, you know, this whole lack of knowing when this will end, did that have an impact on you? Well, I mean, as many gurus know, you know, you can live for a very long time with no food, but it's very, very difficult to live with uh, with no water. And I came out of that uh, with, um, oh, we had less than perhaps a quarter of a cup of water per day for 13 and a half days. It was renal failure uh, that, that was actually killing us. 
not the hypothermia or the frostbite or the lack of food. And I promised myself uh, that if I ever get out every morning, every morning, I will have a glass of cold water. I am so thankful that I'm still having that glass of, of cold water, no matter where I am. Um, and, you know, it's water is something that, that hopefully that we will, will never run out of. Safe water, a lot of people don't have. And yeah. so it's uh, learning how to make water safe is really important. But that's one of the, the, the things that harks back to my mind every morning when I get up. I have that, that, that glass of cold water. What a story, Mark, really. I'm just going to move on to Shazia. Shazia, yours is a very, very interesting story. I know that you you were booked out, your shows were booked out until March, May, June. I remember some of my friends from last month wanting to attend your shows and suddenly, one, you are at home, you know? So one, how are you coping with that? And two, I'd love to know your experience on the island with the team that you had and mm -hmm. your experience on the Celebs and Solitary. Well, uh, there's no stand-up comedy happening now, obviously, because uh, uh, there's no audience. I mean, I've been booked to do a gig in LA next Friday, but I'm doing it online. Oh, wonderful. I'm doing it on Zoom, but it's not the same, doing it from my bedroom to a screen. You know, you really need an audience. It's really important for stand-up to have a live audience, and I, I don't have that. So I don't know when this will happen again because, you know, I was going to do Glastonbury and Latitude and all these festivals where people are gathered, social gathering. And I don't know when that will happen again in the near future. Um, it might be a year. Wow. Um, and so it could be the death of live stand-up for a long time. But we'll I talk did more uh, about that. Yeah, we'll talk more about that later. But tell me more about your uh, experience on the island and your experience. With Bear Grylls. Um, well, when Mark was saying there about how important water was, uh, we didn't have any water for seven days. We had no water. We had no food, no clothes, no mobile phone, no computer, um, no internet, uh, nothing. We had nothing apart from the clothes we were wearing. And um, we had to survive for a month. Can you and, give a bit of a background on what the show was about, Shazia? Well, it's you have to survive. It's a survival survival show. And uh, you walk on an island, right? Uh, yeah, we don't know where the island is. We don't know where we are dropped off or anything. Um, and we, we just have to survive. And not all of us did survive. I did. I survived to the end, um, which was a month. And um, the way that we did it, really, the survivors, was we, it was mind over matter for me. It was about the mind. The mind was more important than the body because the mind tells the body what to do. The body doesn't tell the mind. The mind tells the body. So we kept busy. That was the first thing, is that I woke up every day and I found things to do. I'd never caught any fish in my life, um, but I started fishing and I caught all the fish for a whole month. I caught over a hundred fish and uh, I was attacked by a stingray. I was bitten to death by sandflies and mosquitoes. It was horrific, but I caught the fish. That's what I made my mental thing to do every day was I must get up and I must fish. Uh, some days I got fish, some days I didn't. But I made sure that this was something that I was doing every day to keep busy. Another thing we did was we, the, the women in particular, we spoke to each other. We had conversations with each other. The men didn't do this as much. And that's why in the beginning there was five men and five women. In the end, who survived was four women and two men. Women are better survivors than men because women are um, very good at using the mind over matter. Women are very good at communicating, talking to each other. The men, they wanted to get up every morning and hunt, kill and sleep. This is all they did for a whole month. Mark, so, you, sorry, I'm going to interrupt there, Mark. Any comments on that? I can see your face. Uh, <laughs> oh, classic. Yeah, absolute classic. And 
in many ways, you are quite right. Uh, I mean, um, a lot of men are like that. Uh, but don't tar us all with the same brush, eh? Don't tar yeah. us all with there the was same brush. Two, there was two that made it to the end. Uh, two men. Um, <laughs> out, of how many, out of how many, Shazia? Five. So out of five men and five women, two men made it. And how many women made it? Four. Oh. Yeah. That's it all. But, but Bergwill said that this was normal. This was what always happened. That there was always more women survivors than men. But I, I thought what was interesting when this coronavirus happened, everybody running to the shops to get toilet roll. And I thought this was hilarious because this we were on this island with no toilet roll, no food, no water, no clothes, no internet. Like I, we couldn't even do what we're doing now. There was no internet. And when this coronavirus happened, I was watching it and I was thinking, of all the things in the world you need to survive and you're you're running for toilet roll you're stocking up on toilet roll i thought this is a first world problem because nobody in the middle east uses toilet roll nobody is running for this thing and i just thought what well, that was such a weird thing uh because you know if you're you're not going to be eating that much. You're not going to need that much toilet roll. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is that most people didn't don't even didn't even think about that. What they saw was that somebody in the first place started buying some toilet rolls, and then everyone else thought, well, if they're buying them, uh, we're going to run it out, and so we need to buy them as well. And it was a self fulfilling prophecy, and it could have easily have been something else, but in in this case. It just happened to be toilet rolls, you know, yeah. and as someone said, you know, in 20 years' time, you know, um, they're just lucky that the toilet rolls don't have a use-by date on them. <laughs> Shazia, I have a question for you on this. Now, how do you compare your experience? This herd, this, this, herd, this herd mentality is what got us into trouble in the first place. Yeah. You know, following the crowd, listening to whatever, look at what everybody else is doing. Let's jump on the bandwagon and do what they're doing. This is what got us into into problems in the first place. Brexit, coronavirus, everybody listening to the wrong information. When we were on the island, we didn't have the privilege to do that. Yeah, sure. we, we just had to do whatever to survive. Um, and that was getting food and supporting each other. Amazing. Shazia, on that, how do you compare that experience on the island to the experience you had on the reality show the celebs in solitude, where you chose to be in a container yeah. for five days without anything, right? With basics. So just tell yeah. us a bit of that, had, about that, and then share the experience. We had no, that was different because there was no natural light. So at least we can go out of the house here once a day for an hour exercise. When I was in solitary confinement, it was like a prison cell, like people on death row are in solitary. It was like that. So there was no natural light. There was no air. It was, um, I was locked in a metal container. Um, and the food that I had was in packets. So I had to make it myself. Um, I, had, I didn't speak to anybody. And there was no contact with the outside world. So I was on my own. So that very much is about the mind because I don't have anybody to talk to. I didn't have any music nothing so uh, what i did was i made sure i exercised every day in my container i did yoga and meditation every day in the container um i also woke up every morning and i made a plan of things to do for the day what i was going to write about so i wrote um, my book i wrote a sitcom i wrote stand-up material and I kind of wrote a, a diary of the things that I was thinking. And, and it's funny, when you're in solitary like that, you regress and you think a lot about the past and you think a lot about your childhood and you think about things that are not in the immediate, but you think about things that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, because you only have your mind to think about things. And that can be very depressing 
and you have to keep upbeat about this. I did a lot of meditation and yoga to help me, and um, I wrote a lot. So, so Mark, you were in a similar situation, 13 and a half days in an ice cave with just one other person. So what were the tools you used? Oh, it was very much um, exactly as stated. It's, it's about looking at what you can change right now. It's about making the small decisions and making them decisively and doing it. And it's exactly the same now. It's um, you, you can't be worrying about the things that you can't change, but you need to be focusing on the things that you can change. In that ice cave, it was like that. We had two people, you know, where Phil and I could bounce ideas off each other. Um, and other times of my life, it's uh, just been myself. I, I, isolation has been a, a critical element of what I've done. Uh, in the climb of Choi Yu in, in, uh, in 2004, I spent nine days at uh, six and a half thousand meters in a tent by myself because I didn't want to have to go back down. And that was very much uh, um, uh, doing the diary, uh, very much concentrating on on the small decisions that I need to make. And, and these things have happened uh, often in my life. And so much of it is around fix those small things and then um, use the, 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 the expanse of your mind, uh, the freedom that you have uh, to create new thoughts. Brilliant, brilliant things for us all to remember and to use in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, Mark. Mark, so you think that experience uh, that you had in the ice cave, did that help you cope with what's happening right now? Or have oh, you seen that person? Oh, absolutely. Um, for me, it was the gold standard, uh, the gold standard of so many different things. Uh, it was a very difficult time that I only just barely survived. Everything else is easier. Uh, and But you can think back and what would I have done different what in this situation right now, what are the things that I can do? Um, I don't want to be in two years' time looking back going, I could have done that different. Sure. Learn the lesson. You know, as a motivational speaker, um, no. You know, every job from now till Christmas time is gone. And I would suggest through into 2021, we have to find a new way of, of earning a living, a new way of presenting what, we want to do. I want people to learn the lessons that I've learned. And so it's finding a new way of doing that. You know, what is brilliant about you, Mark, that we've already been in contact with clients and clients are reaching out for your story because they know your story of, you know, being in the ice cave, of how you fought it all, right? And today you're sitting here and you can still share your story, no matter where you are, from New Zealand, from wherever you are in your home. It doesn't matter. The clients are reaching out. So Thank you for sharing that story and the wonderful lessons that you're sharing with us. Shazia, coming back to you, what do you think has helped you in this current environment? You as your personality, your attitude, you being a woman, or just the fact that you've experienced different things in life? Um, I think because I've been in two types of different solitary situations, one is in the jungle where I was with other people, but I didn't know any of them, but it was about survival. And then the other one about being in total solitary confinement. I know how to make use of my time. It's very easy to not be motivated in this time. People who are very used to being with other people all the time, they're going to find this difficult. Um, but actually, this is a gift. There's so much you can do by yourself. There's so much you can create. Um, there's so much to do, even if it's basic stuff like you know, fixing the toilet, painting your house. I mean, there is so much to do. It's so easy to say, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed by this. I don't know what to do. You, could, you, you can so easily waste this time, but you can do work on yourself. You can meditate, you can do yoga, you can keep a diary of this, you can write, you can be creative. Creativity is very therapeutic. I mean, I know it's part of my job to be a writer and a comedian, but, you know, to write about this, um, to watch lots of movies that you feel that you could have watched, loads of books you wanted to read that you haven't read. There's so much to do um, if you want to do it. But it's also so easy to say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is happening and not do anything. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's very valuable time that you could be used to be creating stuff. So when the world does start working again, you're ready for it. You're ready to contribute. You're ready to give stuff. And you're ready to tell your experience about what happened while you were in solitary. You know, Shazia, the common thing that I used to say, because I am a workaholic, as we all know, 20 hours, 22 hours is, is what I would put into my work. I didn't have time for anybody, my family, my friends. Uh, there is a long list of people that I promised to meet I never met. Not that I can meet them now, but at least I can hang out with them online. You know, I have time for them. And that's one thing that I would say that I couldn't create new things because I didn't have the mental mind space. I was I never had the time to just sit and think and say, OK, this is a great idea. Let me expand on that idea. This has given me that opportunity to think, to allow myself to create new opportunities, not just for us, us not just for speaking minds, which is very important, which means speaking minds will look after the talent that we manage, right? But also for myself, for my family, I think it's an amazing time to go through. Now, how yeah. long will it last? We don't know. I, you've been following stories about India, I'm assuming, all of us, yeah. the way the world is connected. Yeah, very much so. So there's one thing, Shazia, that I want to talk to you about is that in your uh, article in The Guardian about the island, uh, being on the island with Bear Grylls, you mentioned that survival doesn't discriminate. And now this has been written long time ago. What a fascinating article to read. Can you just share a little bit more about that? Well, I wrote that for The Guardian uh, in November last year, so just about six months ago. And I said that, you know, when we were on the island, I was with people I didn't know never met them before they'd never met me and we were in a very enclosed space 10 of us for a month well some of us didn't make it but it was very difficult and you know especially when you're hungry and you ha you don't have anything we still you know and so i knew there were people that didn't like me and there were people that i didn't like because you know we all felt that you know you're not pulling your weight you know i'm doing all the work you're not doing this so we had feelings of animosity towards each other but one thing we didn't do was we didn't argue between us. I didn't, I didn't, there was people I didn't like and there were people that didn't like me, but none of us argued with each other. And we just kept our hatred, any feelings that we had towards each other, we kept it to ourselves. And we just got on with the work. And when I came off the island, when we came off the island, um, we forgot why we hated each other we forgot why we were angry towards each other and we just got on with each other and we forgot and what i was saying in the article is that keep, sometimes keep your hatred to yourself because in the end when you come out of the situation that you're in you will forget why you hated in the first place and you realize it's just the circumstances under which we are under that causes us to behave that way. But once we came off the island, you know, we were, we're really close friends. We have a WhatsApp group. We get on with each other. We talk about our experience all the time. And I related this to Brexit is, and the Archbishop of Canterbury saying, you know, there was a time when we kept our hatred to ourselves. And as a result of that, we were kind of faking it till we made it. We were, get, we were kind of getting on with each other. And then Brexit happened and we realized, he said, I realized then that now it was out of the bag. We know that everybody hates each other and now there's no going back because we know that everyone hates each other. And he said, you know, sometimes just keep your hatred to yourselves and fake it till you make it and you will forget all, our, all, the, all the disagreements that we have between each other. And so when I was when I wrote that article, I said that, you know, when you are starving to death on on the island, when you have no food, no water, no clothes, you don't know how you're going to survive. It doesn't matter what race, religion, color, gender you are on that island. There was everybody, but it never came into it. I, I never, ever saw people's color or gender. We just saw it as we are 10 people trying to survive and i would say that the time that we live in now it's the same thing is that it doesn't matter really survival has no color or or, or race or
religion or gender. It's such a simple message, isn't it? Shaza, it's such a simple message. It's something that should be part of us anyway. But for some reason, we seem to have forgotten over the years, over the generations, and somehow the universe is reminding us of the simplicity, all the things that you both have said today. You know, just making sure that you keep busy. Every morning, do what you have to do. You talk about hope. You talk about making sure that you exercise, meditate, you you know enhance your creativity. You talk about each other in the best way possible. That you are not thinking about things that are about you know discriminating race. I mean, where is that anyway? The question to you, Mark. I know you're a huge fan of India, and India loves you as well. So please tell me if you've read news reports about the whole migrant exodus or how India is coping with this right now, although it's very early stages there. So what's your message to India? Oh, I have a, a huge concern for, for India, for so many of the people there. Um, the, the lack of infrastructure uh, for so many of them is going to be an incredible challenge. And uh, my heart goes out to them. The, the whole concept of, of isolation, you know, the whole concept of, of, Distancing it just is, isn't going to happen. But one of the things that I do know is that our biggest lessons in life come from the most difficult times. It's just sometimes it's a bit hard to see them. We should be learning from the past and making sure that as these lessons are, are, are rising to the surface now, that we, we grab hold of them and we make the most of what we've got. It's about uh, critical decision making just the uh, the scale, most people just do not understand the scale of, of Mumbai, of Delhi, of, of all of the major cities, let alone the rural areas. It's um, My heart goes out to them. I hope the heat in India is, uh, is a real factor in minimizing the transmission of COVID-19. I hope it is. Mark, you're very, uh, you know, fortunate to have a prime minister like Jacinta Ardern, right, who put measures in place very quickly. And uh, how do you compare that to what is happening without being too political, what's happening in the UK? You know, and we've had we've seen 3,600 deaths in the UK as of last night. We don't know the count as of today. This is as of last night. So what do you see? How do you see that in comparison to UK? And we're all privileged. We all hear very privileged developed countries. Well, I mean, the UK went down a line that sounded good at the start. You know, the whole concept of herd immunity. Um, but. Uh, COVID-19 doesn't play by the rules, and that's what um, you are now finding out. And so the, the, the Jacinda took fantastic advice, her whole team. You know, it's when this first happened, I thought, there's an election coming in September. You're never going to get re-elected having to deal with this. But the fantastic way in which her and her team have dealt with it, I would say it's um, if you don't re-elect her, then, I'd, uh, you know, it's like... Um, um, why not? Um, she's doing. A, they everyone's doing a fantastic job. They are taking upon themselves great advice, but they're also uh, taking a, upon themselves the criticism and answering it as well. We're we're in a really privileged position. It's hurting, you know, for so many people, and it's going to hurt for years to come. Um, but there won't be the deaths. Shazia, I'm going to talk to you about. Pakistan, about where your family originally comes from. So I hope your family in Birmingham is safe, your parents are safe and looking after themselves. And do you have any view about what's happening in Pakistan right now and how they are coping with this? Because we're hearing all the stories about India, but not really getting news about Pakistan. Um, well, obviously, I've seen on the news that people are being beaten in the streets in India to get off the street. But as we know, most of the people live on the street, so I don't know where they are meant to go. Um, in Pakistan, it's around about the same kind of thing. I know that they're not letting any people into the country who have not been tested for COVID-19. Um, the thing is, in Pakistan, they have many kind of very poor country, a lot of social problems. And for a lot of people, they already live on the street. There's nowhere for them to go. You know, there's a lot of women there in marriages, but they don't want to be in marriages. And they are facing domestic violence in very small, you know, environments, one bedroom flats, things like that. Nowhere for them to go. They just have to put up with this. I mean, 
they have a lot more social problems, say, that we have in England. You know, there's a lot of help here. There's a lot of aid. There's a lot of charities. Uh, there's a lot of information. They don't necessarily have that in Pakistan. And um, that's unfortunate, especially for women and children. Right, right. It's really sad. I mean, we've been hearing so many stories about things that are happening in less privileged countries, right? Less underdeveloped countries. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to end this very shortly, guys. Thank you very much. I've learned so much today, and I hope our audience who's listening in have learned a lot. There are fantastic tips you have given. I don't want to repeat those tips because I think those are tips, those are experiences that you've shared that we need to learn from. A couple of things before we go. Is there one key message that you can give to people who are listening to this? Mark? Oh, it's um, uh, make the most of every day. Uh, is just if you're in isolation, that what a fantastic opportunity that that you have. It's about um, make the most of every day. The, the life is carrying on. Life hasn't stopped. Uh, life is carrying on. Um, engage in it. Shazia, um, you have food and you have water. You will survive. You will survive. We are very lucky. Um, but like, you know, make the most of every day, create stuff, learn stuff, read stuff, watch stuff. There is so much to do and it really is mind over matter. Brilliant. I have been receiving lots of comments as we've been speaking. There's one interesting comment from Manoj Gursahani, a friend of ours. He says, also best time to observe equanimity. And I think what a fantastic thing to do. We are all one today. The world has brought us, COVID-19 has brought us together, basically. The world is one. And that's what I'm going to leave all of us with. Let's stay positive. Let's keep mind over matter. And you're at Speaking Minds. We're very privileged to have people like Mark Ingalls, Shazia Mirza, and many others who keep us motivated, who keep us inspired. Please engage us to engage you. And thank you very much. Stay safe, everyone. Stay well. And let's see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.